Okay. What I'd like to do uh, this afternoon then is share a little bit with you the findings from our gear team uh, and talk a bit about the seismological and the geo geotechnical aspects uh, of the Darfield earthquake. Uh, of course, I want to recognize uh, my, the, the, my fellow team members. Russell Green from Virginia Tech was our, was our team leader, and we worked very closely with Mishko um, Drubranovsky from University of Canterbury, along with a number uh, of other uh, New Zealanders, including Vic Pender from University of Auckland, uh, and, a, and a great number of their students, as well as some, some consulting firms uh, in, the, in the Canterbury area. Um, I also, uh, we had six other team members, John Allen, Brady Cox, Bill Godwin, Tara Hutchinson, uh, Ed Kavisangin, and Tom O'Rourke, who just returned from the earthquake uh, just, just, uh, just recently. So for us, for the GEAR team, what we really try to focus on are, are, is collecting that perishable data following the earthquake, uh, trying to measure, trying to get these case histories of lateral spreads and liquefaction so that we can use those to assess our computer models so we can do a better job of anticipating what's going to happen in the next, next earthquake. Um, what I'll cover today, I'll talk a little bit about the seismology, uh, the seismology or the, of the earthquake. I'll spend some time talking about liquefaction, lateral spreading, uh, a little bit of time on the levees, or what they call in New Zealand stop banks, um, finish up on the lifelines, and you'll hear a little bit about the impact on structures by some of the other speakers this afternoon, namely Bill and, and uh, Mary Camario. So the earthquake... Um, it, it, in New Zealand, it occurred on the 3rd of September, Mary, thank you. Most of the, uh, our data shows it's on the 4th, but it's the 3rd. Uh, it occurred about 50 kilometers west-northwest of Christchurch. And the, the Canterbury area, you know, if you look at the effective population, it's about 400,000 people. Uh, it was a magnitude 7.1 magnitude along the newly named Greenfield Fault. Um, and it was primarily reverse fault mechanism. Initially, it looked like it was a dextral strike slip with some reverse faulting. And I think in New Zealand now, they're looking at it's primarily a reverse type fault. So here's Darfield uh, in this area here. Uh, Christchurch is here. You'll hear, a lot, you'll hear uh, most of this talk will talk about Christchurch as well as Kayapoi, which is a bit to the north. Uh, the Waimakaria River comes through uh, the Canterbury Plains into, into Kaiapoi, as well as the Kaiapoi River joins the Waimakaria uh, in Kaiapoi. And south of Christchurch is an area that is referred to as the Selwyn District Council. So New Zealand is not, uh, you know, there are no strangers to earthquakes. They're the, uh, uh, the two plates are coming together along uh, underneath the island. Um, and the northern part of the island is moving a bit faster. The convergence is a bit faster than the southern parts. And so you really get widespread seismicity. Um, the area that we're talking about here, this is the North Island, this is the South Island, and the Canterbury region is right here. Um, you can see the widespread uh, distribution of the aftershocks following the, Deer, the, uh, the Darfield earthquake. Again, Christchurch is over here. Darfield is in this region over here. Uh, the surface expression of the fault rupture was about 30 kilometers. Our gear team was there between a week and two weeks uh, after the earthquake, uh, and it seemed like every day the ex surface expression of the fault was growing. Uh, and this was also something that the uh, local municipalities were dealing with, is that they would do some repairs, and then as things continued to settle, uh, uh, they also continued, they had to redo some of the repairs that they were finding. Uh, these are some uh, photos of the fault rupture surface. Um, the lateral displacement was about up, up to four meters in some areas. Vertical displacement was up to, up to a meter. Um, this is some of the airborne LIDAR data that was obtained by the, by the New Zealand government following the earthquake. Uh, and you can see here the, ex the expression of the fault in the Darfield area. And yes, this was a new fault, uh, really the Alpine Fault running along the, uh, to the west um, is where, uh, you know, where they were anticipating the seismicity to take place. And this newly, fault, newly found fault uh, was a surprise to many people except maybe the people that are living, uh, living with it. Uh, the ground motions in the area, there were several 
um, about a half a dozen strong motion instruments registered uh, peak ground accelerations that were greater than 0.7 G. Uh, those uh, tended to be the vertical accelerations, and people are reviewing those strong motion records to see if that's a, a if if uh, uh, if those are the good representation of actually what took place. There's one record I, I saw that was greater than 1.25 Gs, and again, there's, there may be some problems with that record. This is, uh, these are the, the spectral accelerations from uh, a, the, the North School in Kayapoi, which is north, the, the area that was affected north of, of, Canter, of, uh, of Christchurch. Peak ground accelerations in Kayapoi range between 0.3 and 0.4 Gs. Uh, if you also look at the, um, uh, there's a record at the Christchurch Hospital in, down, in, in Christchurch, the peak ground acceleration there was about 0.2 about 0.2 Gs. So what I'd like to do then is talk, really, from the geotechnical standpoint, liquefaction was really the main impact or the main, main effect from this earthquake. Um, and what I'll talk in, now just for a few minutes, talk a bit about liquefaction and lateral spreading. So the city of Christchurch was certainly anticipating, uh, liqu it was anticipating liquefaction. What we see here is a map um, produced, uh, um, produced by the government. The areas in red are areas that are prone to liquefaction during levels of high groundwater. Uh, I've read that up to 50% of the residences in the city of Christchurch are susceptible to liquefaction damage. Now this is, our, uh, this is the map of areas from, that our team went into, surveyed, and, and found evidence of liquefaction. Um, what, I've, what I have uh, uh, Tom O'Rourke, one of our team members, indicated that the feeling is that about 5 to 10 percent of the, of the homes in Christchurch were affected somehow by liquefaction. Um, again, just to show you, this is, uh, this is the city of Christchurch here. Uh, Kayapoi is up here to the north. This is the Waimakariri River. Um, the Kayapoi River is coming in uh, from the north. Um, and there are several, several parts of Christchurch that were particularly effective. Darlington, um, uh, Avonside, uh, New Brighton, and Bexley. Over in this region, Avonside and Darlington are in this area. Uh, and these are areas where they had widespread liquefaction in these residential areas. Yes? What is the fault trace on this? The fault trace is about 50 kilometers to the west of here. So this was a very common site. This is in uh, Avonside in, uh, in, the city, in, in Christchurch. Uh, sand boils and liquid, you know, evidence of liquefaction throughout these neighborhoods. Um, and there was some damage to, you know, damage to the homes, and I think you'll hear a bit more about these, but certainly, uh, you know, along, associated with this liquefaction uh, was aerial settlements and damage to the, to the uh, water lines, the sewer mains, as well as the, uh, as well as the storm drains. Um, in this case, in this neighborhood in, in, uh, in Christchurch, uh, porta potties were set up all along the street. And if you look back here, uh, you can see a pile of sand. And there were piles of sand everywhere in the streets. And these are from people picking it up with, you know, with uh, small wheelbarrows, wheeling it out to the street and pile it up so the city can, can, can dispose of it. Uh, and this was really just, it, it, was, it struck me that it was so widespread around these neighborhoods. It was, um, it was amazing. Uh, this is an area, this is, uh, um, uh, this is a, a neighborhood uh, west in the, the eastern part of Christchurch. You can see some evidence of sand boils along this lowland. There's actually lateral spreading that took place affecting some of, the, affecting some of these homes. Uh, and again, uh, widespread liquefaction. You can see the sand starting to pile up here um, beside this house. Okay. Uh, when we were there, the estimates seemed to vary quite a bit on the number of homes that were, were actually damaged from liquefaction. Um, the, the best number that we saw, and this is within a couple weeks after the earthquake, was around 1,500 homes that were damaged about 500 that were severely damaged. Uh, but in the paper, you know, this soon after the earthquake, there were so, some reports of up to 10,000 homes that were, were, were damaged from, from liquefaction. Now, as part of our gear investigation, what we want to do is, is try to, to uh, as be, if we find a case history, an area where we can take careful measurements, 
and document what took place, we can then use that to validate some of our models. One of these case histories uh, is the St. Paul's Church in Dallington. Uh, this is a church where it, had a, it, had, it suffered a bearing capacity failure as a result of liquefaction, and the team spent a good day there taking detailed measurements of the settlement as well as the distribution of, of ground settlement in the area. Uh, we were also able to collect several, in, in several cases, uh, case histories of lateral spreading that we're able to measure and again document so that we can add this to our lateral spreading database so that we can validate our models that are out there on how, uh, on predicting lateral spreading in the future. For the levees and stop banks, uh, again, there was uh, liquefaction had, had a, a significant effect on the, on, on the stop banks in the region. Um, this is uh, pictured here is uh, our uh, John Allen. He's from TRI Environment, Environmental, part of our gear team, and is currently based in uh, Christchurch. It was a great asset to the team to have somebody local uh, able to help us out. Uh, several of these cracks, uh, this is one of the more shallow ones. We didn't want to have any OSHA uh, problems with uh, being in something that was too deep, but clearly some of these were well over uh, somebody's head. So in Waimakariri and the Kaiapoi Rivers, um, there was significant flooding problems, and so in the 1920s they added these stop banks or these levees to try to control the flooding in, these, in, the, in the areas. Um, and in speci so specifically, if we look at, uh, this is the Kaipoi River here. Um, this is the Waimakariri River here. Uh, there's a, in total, there is about 30 kilometers worth of these stop banks. Uh, about five kilometers of these stop banks were, were s severely affected from liquefaction lateral spreading as a result of the earthquake. Um, this is their Highway 1, and down to the south end would be the Christ, would be Christ Church. So in many of these areas, um, as part of the gear team, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, Russell Green from Virginia Tech and Brady Cox uh, from University of Arkansas. They came with their dynamic cone penetration test equipment as well as the SASW uh, uh, test equipment. And so in many of these cases, not only at the stop banks, um, but also in uh, areas where we saw significant liquefaction and some areas or boundaries where we s observed liquefaction and where we saw there was no liquefaction, uh, they were able to collect this data immediately after the earthquake. And so uh, it's, a, it's a wealth of information for us, and that's information that is published in, our, in the GEAR report and is open to, in, currently open to the public. So we also spent, uh, I was part of the team investigating the life, the geotechnical uh, aspects of the earthquake and how they affected lifelines. Um, on the left side of this picture, that we did see several foot bridges uh, that had, a, had some troubles after the earthquake. But I think the bigger story, certainly from the lifeline aspect, is the water and waste, you know, the water and wastewater and the effect on the, the uh, um, water systems as a result of the liquefaction. So if we start out with bridges, you know, uh, mobility was essentially unaffected by the earthquake. There were some bridges that may, were, were temporarily closed, uh, but for the most part you could get, in, when we were there six days after the earthquake, and you could really get anywhere that you wanted to go. Um, what I'm pointing out here, this is a picture of the uh, Bridge Street Bridge uh, in Christchurch. Uh, and this is a bridge that performed well. It was temporarily closed. There was a settlement of the approach fills uh, that were qu pretty quickly filled up with some, uh, with some uh, gravel and new pavement so that you get rid of that bump coming onto the bridge. Um, on all four sides of the bridge, there was lateral spreading that took place uh, on the order of one meter. Um, but the bridge itself performed very well. Uh, this is a picture of the abutment. They had uh, uh, several um, uh, 60 centimeter uh, diameter um, octagonal piles battered, uh, battered in the front row and vertical in the back. And looking at the, the bearings, we're actually able to measure the, the amount of movement on each one of the bearings on the bridge. We're able to record that. And so now this is a case where we have limited abutment movement. Both abutments moved uh, toward the river 
but on the, only on the order of, uh, of a few centimeters, uh, while the lateral spreading on all, four, on all sides of the bridge was on the order of about a meter. This is a good case history for us that we can use to evaluate our, uh, the analysis of our abutment, performance of abutments as a result of lateral spreading. Uh, the rail system had some problems, um, but, but really they were some problems. They were pretty, pretty uh, quickly fixed. Uh, and so, and, and again, the system was not down for that for, for uh, uh, only for a few days in these areas. So the water and the sewer mains, that was really the problem, and so uh, a, a big problem. And so um, many of the, the uh, manholes as a result of the liquefaction popped up. Many also settled. We, uh, we met with utility engineers in the Waimakariri district. Uh, where they had surveyed, quickly surveyed all of the manholes, and it was scattered. Uh, many were coming up, many were, were, were rising up, others were, were coming down, and their benchmark had likely moved anyway. And so lots of differential movement of the manholes. That differential movement ends up breaking the pipes. Um, and we saw all through, throughout the area where they were replacing pipes and getting water back to the people, focusing on drinking water and then worrying about sewer later. Uh, just as a, a, a spot check, if we look at Christchurch City Council, um, they s figure they have 25 kilometers of, of water lines that need to be replaced as a result of liquefaction from this earthquake, and up to 70 kilometers of wastewater lines need to be replaced. Uh, when we were talking with, uh, with the utility engineer, uh, he, he saw that he felt that they had done a year's worth of repairs in about six days, and you 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 know as a as a you know you, you think about the ability to do that, and, and they were able to bring in people from all over the country to help out with these repairs, uh, but that's a terrific num that's a terrific amount of work. Um, and then if you look at the amount of ejecta, I mean there's 11,000 tons of ejecta uh, in Christchurch City Council, which accounts for about 9,000 cubic meters of uh, potentially voids or at least settlement in the area. Uh, and one of their concerns is long-term settlement um, and what's going to happen as, as time goes on and the ground comes to, uh, get ground, ground comes to equilibrium. If you look at Y. Makariri District Council and the Selwyn uh, District Council, both of those were hit hard. Y. Makariri uh, up in Kayapoi, perhaps harder because they were more... Uh, affected by the lateral spreading, uh, Selwyn District Council to the south of Christchurch, um, perhaps a bit less. Um, if you look at the sewer damage, one of the other, you know, if you focus on getting the drinking water back to the, to the residents uh, with a, a secondary goal of replacing the, the wastewater, uh, when we were in the um, in Waimakariri uh, district area, uh, still 40% of the sewage was still being essentially, you know, dumped untreated into the, uh, into the groundwater, into the rivers. They're unable to treat that water. So for the most part, the lifelines perform very well, right? In the big picture, they perform very well in this earthquake. Uh, mobility was essentially unaffected. Uh, electric power was at 90% within about 24 hours. There was no problems with the, trans the transmission system. Uh, and much of that remaining 10% was really for safety reasons because of some of the damaged buildings that were in, the, for example, in the Christchurch uh, downtown area. Gas lines performed reasonably well. Uh, the cellular phone system uh, seemed to be unaffected at the time that we were there. Uh, we understand that they made that the um, uh, local cell phone, some of the local cell phone companies had made arrangements with local farmers uh, to fill uh, to provide diesel for some of their generators to try to keep some of the cell phone tires, cell phone towers operating if there was a loss in electrical power. Um, we did inspect one of the, the, the area's landfill, but it was far north of Christchurch, um, and it, uh, it kept up with demand, and they, uh, but were working extra shifts to try to, to take on the, the waste from the building damage as well as building contents. Uh, one of the things, you know, talking with the, with, the, um, with the landfill operator was that they actually had to, there was so much uh, moisture and water in the, in the waste because of the foodstuffs and, uh, you know, for example, from, the, uh, from some of the uh, um, liquor stores and that sort of thing where they had uh, uh, 
uh, many broken bottles and un unbroken bottles that they still had to take to the landfill. They actually had to work out a process where they dumped uh, uh, some of the waste and let it drain out essentially for a while before they brought it into the landfill uh, and put it in with the rest of the waste. Uh, again, the water and sewer systems were aff severely affected by liquefaction. But overall, this was very good performance of the lifeline, si the lifeline uh, system. Uh, and this is really an effort that they've been undertaking for about 20 years to try to improve the resilience of their lifelines. And I think that, jo uh, that John is going to talk a little bit more about that next. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And you can get more information from the Gear Association website, uh, which is pictured here in our report, should be up, uh, should be up shortly. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.